Hi, my name is Ross Riddleston. Welcome to this Anson McCade Future series of webinars and podcasts. Today, with the help of some industry experts, we're going to be shining some light on the future of technology and business, with particular focus on diversity, skills, and working practices. Today, we're going to be speaking to the CTO of Utilix, Connor Hughes. Good hey, morning, Ross. Um, yeah, look, thanks for, uh, for inviting me in. Um, we're going to talk about uh, AR um, and how it pertains to um, the built environment and what the future trends for augmented reality are. I'm, as you, as you noted, I'm the CTO of Utilix. Uh, what we do is we remove the obstruction from, from construction. Um, we help uh, geolocate and contextualize subsurface utilities for people in the construction industry or for utilities. Um, our technology provides uh, visual representation of assets such as water, gas, uh, power, um, sewerage, stormwater. Um, all of this information, which is uh, contextualized onto our handheld device from our platform, helps um, field workers to be able to more to, to be able to make more uh, empowered decisions and to reduce safety risks and uh, increase cost savings. So you're using augmented reality um, within that. What does that mean? Yeah, sure. So. Within our a, a current platform, we had a 2D representation, which was overlaying uh, utilities uh, as lines on, uh, on a mapping interface. Um, we've evolved in taking that solution further. So, for example, if you're looking down um, Main Street, you will be able to use our um, augmented reality application and be able to visualize where the high-pressure gas, where the high-voltage electricity is, where the water is um, superimposed um, on your built environment. Um, and so within, within your role, you're developing augmented reality for enterprise applications. Um, yeah. what, what, what are the core elements that make AR possible? What are the core elements that make AR possible? AR becomes really magic when you can start browsing reality, um, but this requires constant um, and adaptive access to live data about the surrounding environment. So you need um, real-time geolocation, um, real-time geographic GIS data, um, and you also need to um, have devices. Um, my personal view is that um, headsets and um, bulky lenses aren't quite ready for the consumer market. There are applications in the enterprise space, um, and our platform direction is firmly focused on the um, on the mobile format. So whether it be mobiles or, or tablets, um, to be able to visualize um, subsurface utilities uh, as you're walking through a construction site. Okay. Um, so on a practical level, are we at a point where this technology can be used now? Um, yeah, look, very much so. So you know, we we have um, an enterprise application that's. Uh, allows um, construction companies or utilities to be able to um, locate their uh, assets and to be able to visualize them. Um, you know, there's been a number of uh, proof of concepts. I guess AR really entered the mainstream with the launch of Pokemon Go in 2016. You know, there were so many people running around um, trying to catch them all. Uh, and then um, over the last 12 months, IKEA has launched a map that allows you to place virtual furniture in your home or your office. Um, and you know, there's, uh, I've seen a number of, of apps recently which allow you to uh, point a lens at a wine bottle and to be able to have its provenance revealed um, and to be able to get you know, additional information about um, the terroir and, and you know, all kinds of um, interesting stuff about the, uh, the label. Um, you know, there's there's other um, applications, a couple of things Google have done recently. Um, Google Translate can now um, translate text on the fly if you um, use the AR view. Um, Google also uh, launched their AR core development kit, uh, and as a proof of concept with that, um, they released the Ghostbusters game. So that happened a few weeks ago. 
Um, you know, iPhone X has a really, really accurate um, tape measure. Um, and, you know, again, that's a proof of concept. Um, and you know, if you use things like Facebook Messenger, you can superimpose um, bunny ears or um, tiaras or whatever you want over your image. Well, all of this is the you know, it's the thin end of the augmented reality wedge. Uh, this really is an industry that will be worth billions um, going forward. So I suppose uh, you know, given that there are a few applications now, is there a tipping point or, or a lot going on behind the scenes? Um, yes, uh, Deloitte estimates that there will be um, billion smartphone users globally using augmented reality solutions um, in 2018, so by the end of the year. And by 2020, AR should generate direct revenues of about a, a billion US. Um, you know, so the, how, how mainstream is it going to be then? For e everyone using it in their everyday lives? Uh, yeah, look, I, I believe so, yeah. Um, you know, there's been a lot of over-promising and delivering. Um, Google Glass had a stumble. Um, Snapchat had a, had a go with their spectacles. Um, Magic Leap is an extremely well-capitalized um, startup. It's a $2 billion worth of, of, est of investment. That's billion with a B. Um, Facebook's Oculus' uh, platform has been slightly underwhelming. Um, Microsoft has chosen its own path with its um, HoloLens solution. Um, but you, know, you can bet your Bitcoins that organizations like Amazon and Apple are, are striving, you know, they're really striving to commercialize the technology. And you know, that's written large in the number of patents that have been filed recently around augmented reality. Um, and what are, what are the biggest barriers for augmented reality now? Yeah, look, I don't see the technology becoming truly mainstream until um, the devices, um, for example, for headsets, uh, until they become basically fashionable and miniaturized, um, and that um, you know the cost reduce, uh, the connectivity, um, the, the internet speed is there. Um, you know, Magic Leap, the, um, the startup that I talked about earlier, even with its two billion dollars worth of uh, investment, it still has battery issues, um, so it won't work while it's being charged, and um, that's pretty. It's a pretty fundamental issue for a, a consumer device. So, how do you see it maturing? Um, yeah, look, at its core, um, the power of AR uh, goes out of the way humans process information. Um, we process information at different rates through our five senses. But, um, you know, a picture paints a thousand words. Vision gives us the most information by far. Um, you know, 80 or 90 percent of information that we process is collected via your vision. Um, but there's a bottleneck um, on how much information you can you can uh, absorb. Uh, you know, that's capacity bottleneck is called cognitive load. Um, so everything you do, um, you know, numerous tasks side by side or in parallel, increase your cognitive load. Um, if you're reading. Smartphone directions, for example, and driving, um, you know, that increases your cognitive load. AR helps reduce this. Um, you know, you can superimpose the information, um, for example, in the driving use case. You can superimpose uh, directions on a heads-up display. Um, you know, AR reduces the dependence on information that's not in context, you know, two-dimensional two information um, on pages or screens, and it really helps you be able to um, understand and apply information to the, the real world. Right, right. So do you think businesses have unrealistic, unrealistic expectations about AR due to consumer hype? Um, look, I, I think it's probably the reverse. Um, you know, the press about consumer uses of new technology can impact the perception of the technology in business. Um, you know, if you if you think um, of press around drones, you know, there's been a lot of uh, uh, rules and regulations drawn up recently about about drones, drones, you know, which suggests that they're 
a nuisance um, or a toy. Um, but you know, we see very real um, business applications. For example, in Utilix, we use drone mapping for um, for greenfield uh, construction sites and for um, for capital infrastructure works. Um, and you know, there is use cases um, in the drone industry for inspecting refineries, pipelines, etc. Um, you know, the same goes for blockchain. You know, what was the technology behind Bitcoin, which was, you know, really first seen as the uh, as a currency to be used by um, you know people up to do people doing bad things on the dark web, drug dealers, etc. But you know, uh, businesses are really beginning to understand what blockchain um, is and what the impact are uh, will be on um, on contracts, for example. You know, AR was seen as a game platform initially when it when it uh, hit public consciousness and the, you know there was some bad press when um, Google Glass stalled you know if Google puts its um, its weight behind an initiative and it doesn't gain traction then you know people stand up and take notice um, but you know I think people who work in the AR space um, both in the industrial side and the consumer side are really excited about the uh, the potential of the of augmented reality to to change the way that we interact with um, with the world um yeah, you mentioned Google's AR kit, but I, I saw recently that um, there's an AR dev kit with a new iPhone um, iOS release, um, apparently making it the biggest global AR platform. What, what's this and Google's efforts going to mean? Yeah, look, um, Apple is, is making um, augmented reality a tenpole feature. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's baked into the iPhone 8 and iPhone X and is backported to the seven, iPhone sevens and sixes. Um, you know, they're also, um, according to patents, developing an AR headset for release in the next you know, two to two five years. Um, you know, there, there is. It's not just Apple in the space, though. Um, a Google released AR Core a couple of weeks ago um, from from beta, um, and. You know that has a, a user base of 100 million devices potentially. Um, you know, AR Kit is a supported base. You know, if you extrapolate out from sales numbers of somewhere between 150 to 200 million, so it's a reasonably easy, even playing field. Yeah. Um, other companies, um, Facebook, for example, has AR Studio to allow you to create augmented reality effects within um, within their ecosystem, um, and Amazon has has come into the uh, coming to the, uh, the market as well with its AR view um, to be able to allow consumers to be able to visualize items in their home before they actually make a purchase. Yeah, I guess there's, um, I mean, looking at the um, the tools involved, I guess there's um, a lot of work around design and graphics rendering, but what's involved beyond that from a technical and business perspective? Uh, design is key. Um, you know, there's a uh, there is a talent gap in the user experience um, space in, in the technology industry as a whole. Um, but it's critical to be able to design um, an augmented reality um, experience that's, um, you know, that's useful um, and not just stunning. Um, you know, if it is um, you know, amazing, but it's, it's an unhelpful, then it really defe defeats its core purpose. Content is key too, so people you know, you know, who are able to create the right content are crucial. Um, digital modeling capabilities and knowledge of how to apply them in the AR world are, are also very important. And I suppose conceptualizing how it can be used as well is probably a, probably a big issue. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, so how, how do you think people can get more involved in this, you know, in, in this up and coming technology, you know, be that companies or, or individuals? Yeah, look, you know, there is a lot of enthusiasm and optimism. Um, however, the space is still nascent. Um, and, you know, there's going to be a road, uh, a journey to widespread adoption. Um, you know, you, the um, development experience has now been democratized through the release of AR Kit and AR Core. Um, you know, as a company or individual, if you want to, um, you know, to start experimenting with those um, dev kits, it's, it's quite easy just to. To to um, you know to, to get a proof of concept application up and running. Um, from an organisation perspective, you know if you want to build awareness of technology, um, start using um, AR apps within the company and trialling them, using the headsets, exploring you know, virtual reality. 
Um, just having those devices and the experience around can spark innovation. Um, and all, you know, look, also finding the right partners, people who've got experience in, in the AR space and in, in the development and design side will also help um, people to be able to, uh, organizations to be able to, to, uh, to get involved in the AR space. So what, what sort of toolkits do people need to develop in this space? Yeah, so um, there is AR kit, which is from Apple. Um, that's been live since uh, late last year. Um, AR Core, which is released a few weeks ago from Google. Um, it's, uh, it's designed for Android 8, um, 8 1 up. Um, Facebook is AR Studio. Um, you know, all of these are a stake in the ground. Um, and I'm seeing incremental improvements in the, in the kits, um, in the SDKs. Uh, for example, AR, car, AR Core is now able to um, to deal with uh, textured environments, uh, textured surfaces, and it's now able to be to better situate objects in in the real environment on a textured surface. Um, there's been a some improvements in AR Kit uh, from Apple uh, about um, how it recognizes vertical planes. So that's really a technical way of saying the sensors on your eye device, your iPhone or your iPad, will not only recognize the floor you're on, but also the windows and walls as well. Um, you know, and this is an incremental improvement. Um, so this means that when app devs are, are making AR apps now, they can also build in features with, which can utilize the, the vertical space around you as well as the, the horizontal space. So it's kind of blurring the line between AR and VR almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, well thanks, Connor. Some, some really interesting insight there. I mean, it sounds like we are on the cusp of um, uh, big changes in the, in the way we're using technology and um, interacting interacting with the world. So, I said final question for, from me: Do you think that we'll be be seeing Google Glass and all, all wearing crazy crazy glasses in the future to to see all this? Um, yeah, look, Google Glass is, is an interesting one, and as I said earlier, it's it's stalled, um, but it's still out there. It's getting some great reviews from. Um, from, from business, uh, it's still being used in the manufacturing and healthcare. So Google is still uh, gathering data and uh, improving that experience. Um, and you know, from the AR perspective, uh, there's uh, there's a, a consensus and, and, a, and a thought moving out there that AR has the potential to become the fourth platform in computing. So in the 80s, uh, personal computing destroys the, the mini computer companies, and that's all the launch of Apple and Microsoft. In the 90s, um, the internet exploded, um, spawned Google and Amazon, um, Facebook. Um, and then in uh, 2007, the iPhone was launched. Um, and you know, that kicked off the mobile era. Um, some organizations thrived, others like Microsoft fell to the wayside in the mobile space. Um, so I guess devices, whether they be um, on the mobile side or, or headsets, aren't necessarily the, the future, but I think AR certainly is. Great, great. Connor, thank you very much for your time. Um, that was a really interesting insight, actually. I, you know, you, you see this kind of technology uh, out there, like, um, like Pokemon, for example, and it's easy to take that stuff for granted, but it is, um, it's, it's quite uh, interesting to see, see where things are happening. Um, thanks for your time. Um, to find out more about um, Connor and Utilix, we'll post some um, links below. Um, and thanks for, thanks for taking the time out to, to do this webinar for us. And, um, and, and thanks to all the viewers for, for watching as well. Um, hope to see you next time. Great. Thanks, Ross. Appreciate it.